Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning. It's so nice to see everybody. Thank you all for being here today. I'm just going to shut this door. Okay, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Treaty 8 land, which is the traditional territory of the Cree, the Dene, and the unceded territory of the Métis. A treaty is a promise or an agreement made between parties. As we are all treaty people, it's important we understand and honor our promises to one another. I would like to acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived and cared for these lands for generations. I make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude on the territory of those whose history, languages, and cultures continue to influence our community today. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, if anybody needs a bathroom break, bathrooms are just out through any of these doors on the side and down this hallway. In the case of an emergency, we will hear an alarm. We will just exit out this back door for the, through the front entrance and muster in the parking lot. And there are some light refreshments here over on the side, so please help yourself during our breaks. We did have a little coffee glitch. I do apologize for that. We've got some Tim Hortons on the way. So my name is Sherry McCachran, and I am the, I'll be the facilitator for today's session. Um, I'm the co-facilitator of the Leadership of Buffalo program, which is run by Few Social. And Few Social exists to support social profits in Wood Buffalo by providing education, leadership development, research, innovation, and collaboration. Leadership of Buffalo has been in the community since 2006. The program brings together leaders across our community for a seven month term each year. During these seven months, the group receives training, team building, and networking opportunities. But one of the most profound parts of their learning journey is the community action project in which the team breaks into smaller groups and chooses a project to work on with the intention of giving back and enhancing our community. We are all here today to learn about the work that this ambitious group of people have poured their hearts into since September. We'll also learn a little bit about their personal learning uh, leadership journey as well. I'd like to offer a huge thank you to our program sponsors, Suncor Energy and the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. Without your generous support, the program and all of the contributions made to the community this year via the program participants would not be possible. I'd now like to welcome Deputy Mayor Alan Grandison uh, to say a few words to our cohort before they start in on their presentations. Deputy Mayor Grandison, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Good morning. So I'm, I'm going to go from, hopefully people can hear me. Can you all hear me? <laughs> oh, right, so it's a little shorter than I, I, I generally don't work from notes, but uh, today I'm going to work a little bit from my notes. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the acknowledgement. Rather than repeat it, I'm just going to write off of your gracious acknowledgement to the lands that we, we work on here in Fort McMurray. So I'm honored to be here on behalf of uh, Regional Council and the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo. Um, it's really nice to see so many people again live and without masks. And I was talking to somebody earlier about not being able to recognize anybody after two years of uh, being covered up. So it's, it's really an honor to see you all here. And I'm grateful that uh, you're all getting an opportunity to come together and celebrate all of your hard work, right? Um, I've been told about your dedication over the last seven months. You worked with the Nishtawawi Association Friendship Center, Past Two Detox Center, Early Years Coalition, and I believe or I'm told that you've even created an app to support the social profit sector. Uh, for some of you who may not know, my background is in the social profit sector. I worked um, for many years as a life skills coach, and I ran St. Aidan's for 15 years. So. I do have a background and a, and a very strong passion uh, to the social profit sector and a belief that their contributions in our communities and in our society is often uh, tremendous but not always recognized to its total impact and magnitude. So I'd just like to acknowledge that. Um, the relationships and projects point towards a significant value 
of community leadership as is evident in the hard work um, of this year's program members and those uh, presentations that we're about to see. Good leadership has always been vital in creating and sustaining successful communities. Through community leaders, we may not recognize their own efforts and the resilient region of Wood Buffalo is no stranger to community leaders who step up to the challenge, big and small. These people are a big part of making our region so special to call home. I've been in Fort McMurray since 1983. We are recognized, you know, we often hear the negative aspects about Fort McMurray. We are recognized around the world as being one of the most generous communities in Canada. One of the communities that does step up. I've, I've witnessed so many things after the virus of 2016 that watched people come together and support each other. And, and this is just more evidence of the resilience and the personalities and the people and the leadership that we have in this community and this region as a whole. And that stretches all the way from Conklin to Fort Chip. You know, we always talk about Fort McMurray, but this is a region and there are leaders that come from all parts of this region to support everybody here. Uh, two years into this global pandemic, we are reminded that reliable, empathetic, innovative, adaptable, and action-driven leaders will continue to pave the path for others to act as well. As I look across the room, I imagine each of you um, have been these leaders for some time in your own home, where you work, and within the community, um, compelling this incredible program to bring you even closer to, you, to your unique leadership styles through an intentional developed process. It's important to get involved in these programs, continuing to make room for community leaders long after graduation. I'm sure you've all experienced the wonderful feeling investing in the community, investing in community that brings making your own involve, involvement and the mutual benef benefit to all. It is equally important to continue getting involved in social profit organizations such as this to encourage individual growth while achieving society, cultural, and economic outcomes benefits for the entire community. So I'd also like to take a moment to thank Pew Social and the leadership of Wood Buffalo for continuing this important work and thank you again for having me today. I'd like to wish all of you good luck in your presentations and once again, congratulate you for all of the hard work. I've seen many people over the years to uh, Leadership Wood Buffalo, and I've been involved in some different ways in the past, but I certainly congratulate you. I know how much hard work is involved, and I know that each of you will have gained some more insight into your own abilities, desires, and um, I guess opportunities to do the things that you want to do and demonstrate the kind of leadership that's unique to each of you individually. So again, thank you for your time, thank you for your social, and good luck with your presentations. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Grandison. Okay, so we have four uh, community action project groups presenting today. Uh, how it'll roll out is I'll introduce each group, which will have 20 minutes to do their presentation, and then we'll allow for 10 minutes from, for questions from the audience, if anybody has any, and then we'll take a 10 minute break in between each group. Um, after all the presentations are complete, we should wrap up around 12 o'clock, uh, and we welcome you all to stay and mix and mingle with each other if you have the time. We'd love, uh, we'd love for you to have, share some time together. I know a lot of us haven't had a lot of that lately, so feel free to stay and, and enjoy. So our first group up is the Past Two Place Project. And in this group we have Jenna Fewer, Lisa Hearn, Thomas Hopkins, Jordan Ratzlaff, and Janelle Watts. Good morning everyone, my name is Jordan Ratzlaff and I have the honour to introduce our Community Action Project. Uh, we're really thankful for you to, to come and join us today and, and hear about how the last eight months have gone for us as a project group on our journey through the Leadership with Buffalo program. Uh, so with me today we have Thomas, Jenna, Lisa and Janelle. We'll talk a little bit more about ourselves uh, as part of this presentation here. We're going to provide some background on our community action project as well as some of those insights into the, the Leadership with Buffalo program and, and why it's been so important for us and, and with so many takeaways. Uh, 
So I'd like to, to talk about past few plays and, and provide some context into uh, like what are we doing here. And, and, and the ask for our group was to support past few plays in transitioning from social detox to medical detox. Uh, I think it's important to refresh ourselves on what past few plays detox center is about and what do they do in the community. And I'll, I'll start with their, their vision. And I think if we can ground ourselves with the vision and mission, it's a good place to start with. So the vision for Pasty Place is to positively transform the lives of individuals who struggle with substance abuse and addiction. And their mission statement, mission statements are, are how you implement that vision, is to achieve our vision by providing a safe environment that inspires individuals through compassion, support, and education. So that, in, a nut, in an essence, is what Pasty Place does. They, they provide detox services, it's non-medical detox services for individuals withdrawing from drugs or alcohol and they provide a safe environment that's monitored for their, their, their clients. Passive Place has been in the community since 1979 and have offered uh, evolving services over that time. Their clientele is a diverse population and addiction does not discriminate so there's a wide diversity of ethnic back backgrounds as well as economic circumstances. The programming that they offer is the, the detox as their namesake program. They provide uh, for individuals that are suffering from withdrawal, a detox program in a monitored environment. They offer a day program for their individuals in, in the, at their facility to get in touch with the impact of their addiction physically, psychologically, and spiritually. And they also offer a pre-treatment program for individuals who are on the list to get into a treatment center, as well as a post-treatment. So when they finish their treatment, they come back to Fort McMurray and they will like to, to help individuals get re-established in the community. Uh, with that being said, I'll, I'll give it over to Janelle to provide some context on what, what our project is about. So go from a medical to a social detox facility, while a social detox is, remains important in our region, the transition into a medical detox facility would increase Passu Place's medical capabilities on a whole. Um, with the transition into the medical detox, it would give them increased funding from AHS, which would then give them the, um, the opportunity to hire nurses or even a nurse practitioner. So, all that, with that being said, when nurses and nurse, pra nurse practitioner could be on site, it could potentially lessen the burden on our local hospital facility. Because currently, uh, for, in a lot of instances, they have to transfer clients and individuals that are detoxing from the facility down to the hospital. So with a nurse or a nurse practitioner on site, they could administer medications there while also um, perform additional medical treatments when necessary. Now currently, Patsu Place is the only detox facility in northeastern Alberta, which means they're covering this entire region, Fort McMurray, Lac La Biche, Fort Chipewyan, Anzac, and many other of the surrounding communities. So that means that any individual that requires medical detox would have to go all the way to Edmonton, which means they're leaving their support system, their families behind, to go to travel to Edmonton and which would then, you know, it could possibly decrease their chances of success in the detox program. And before we go into any further details of our project, we're going to kind of just take a few minutes to introduce each one of ourselves, and I believe Jenna is going to go first. Hmm. So, my name is Jenna Fewer, and I am the North Star Ford Wood Buffalo Volunteer Center Coordinator at Fuse Social. And I grew up in Fort McMurray. I'm from Newfoundland originally, but I would consider Fort McMurray my home just because this is where I've spent the majority of my life. Um, I grew up heavily involved in the arts through dance in the community, so I feel like my recent transition into the social profit sector felt really natural and it felt really right just because I've always been involved in the community in a different way, but it, it does, it's kind of similar. Um, yeah, I've loved this program so much. I feel like I have such a better sense of self and who I am and what kind of leader I want to be and really I'm, cap I'm able to look inwards and make that change. Maybe noticing things about me that I want to do differently and I feel like this program really opened my eyes to that. Good. 
Well, my name is Jordan Rasov, I mentioned. I'm a professional engineer. I work at Suncor Energy. Uh, I've been at Suncor now going on 10 years in various roles in the engineering field, working my way up from the Edmonton Refinery up north. I'm uh, currently an operational excellence management system. It's a bit wordy for the, for the, you know, the, the general public, but uh, Suncor loves acronyms. So we cram that down into OEMS. Um, an OEMS coordinator. And what OEMS is, is it's a framework of, of business processes that we put in place to, to mitigate risk and get towards our business. So it's been, been great, a uh, great role to, to get some exposure to how do we make our company more efficient and a safer place to work. Uh, for myself, I, I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, in the, in the region, so not too far away. I moved to Fort McMurray in 2014, and Thankfully for myself, I found my, my wife was born and raised in Fort McMurray, so coming up here was you know, less of a hard pill to swallow. And about myself, I, I as a husband, I'm a father of an 18-month-old daughter who is just amazing. She puts a smile on my face every day when I come home, like it's kind of refreshing. <laughs> so it's uh, a lot of fun with her. And I'm an avid squash player and coach. If you're interested to learn about squash, you know it's an avid, you know. A niche sport, by, but still, uh, it's, it gets your heart rate going, and that's what we all need a little bit of that. And uh, I enjoy playing hockey and spending time with my family. In terms of my community involvement, I've, uh, I'm, I'm looking to grow and get more experience. I think the world of leadership uh, is so broad, and, and like you got to chip away at it. So I've been involved with uh, Squash Alberta Board of Directors, more recently on the Brainstem Alliance Board of Directors, uh, to try and get something a little more local. And uh, I was also involved with the Alberta Winter Games as the sport chair for Go Figure Squash. <laughs> so great opportunities come with those, uh, you know, unique locations like Fort McMurray as well as those niche sports. So if you're always looking, there's lots of opportunities out there. Uh, and the Leadership with Buffalo program for myself, uh, it's been a great journey of self-awareness and reflection. I think it's very timely in terms of how I'm, you know, with, what, looking at what I'm doing and what, what is what's important to me. So really enjoy the program and, and also meeting a lot of great people. Uh, I think we got Lisa next. Good morning, um, Lisa Hearn. I am one of the supervisors in the maintenance support um, services department in regional services. I have worked at Suncor for just about under, just under 10 years. Um, originally from Newfoundland. However, moving to Fort McMurray in um, 2013, I now consider this my home. Um, I have raised my family here. I am a mother of a two and a half year old and just a four week old little boy actually. So he's come along through the Wood Buffalo program with us. Um, so that, that definitely keeps me busy. Outside of that, I have a huge um, passion for fitness. I actually am certified nutritionist. Um, so just kind of my side passion and something I like to um, work on. In, for me, the Leadership of Buffalo program has been very eye-opening. Um, although I've been here for just under 10 years, just seeing what's in the community and what's available and where we can help and develop as leaders, that's what's very key to me. Um, just like my uh, cohort partners here, very a lot of self-reflection and, and awareness is coming from this program. And, and much like everyone else, at a very good time, I'm very eager to see where this program will lead us moving forward and how we can give back to the community. Hi, uh, my name is Janelle Watton. I am the Child and Youth Manager at Some Other Solutions. And I'm actually also from Newfoundland, grew up in a super, super small town. Uh, you might even hear a bit of the Newfoundland accent come out as we get going here, but I'll try really hard <laughs> to um, I moved here in about 2008 um, and met my husband here and raised family. I have two boys, 11 and 8 years old, who keep me very busy. Um, outside of work, I love to anything to do with nature. I, it's a must for me to be outside in the trees somewhere doing something. Uh, and I'm also a kids and teen meditation teacher, so when I'm not doing that in my role at work, I would love to do that outside. Um, and so I, I, actually, my, I transitioned into the child and youth manager role during this program. And honestly, I don't think it would have been such a smooth process without the Leadership of Buffalo program to support me behind it. So there was a lot of self-reflection, a lot of bringing out those leadership qualities that I knew were in there, but just needed to come to the forefront. So I will be forever grateful for that. 
And I'm Thomas Hopkins, also a professional engineer with Suncor. Uh, I work in our tailings department. I'm the, the contact engineer there. I'm the newest resident in terms of moving to Fort McMurray, so I only came here in 2017, although I spent a year here on an internship with Suncor as well in 2015-2016. Um, I came from Nova Scotia, so a little less far than, uh, than Newfoundland. Um, I, I actually am also a part-time professional photographer. Uh, I also work with my wife. Um, we're both members of the Canadian Forces Reserves, both captains, and we actually work with the local air cadet program as well. So involved in the community in a few different aspects. Um, and if three jobs weren't really enough, I also have a two-year-old who likes to keep <laughs> us on our toes as well. So very, very busy. Um, and for me, I, I really came into the Leadership with Buffalo program expecting it to be very corporate based, you know, coming from a corporate uh, mining setting. Thought I was going to be getting a whole bunch of skills and how to lead people on a team in a, in a corporate sense. And I didn't really appreciate how much self-reflection is required in leadership. And that's really my kind of key takeaway from all of this is how much inward you need to look in order to set yourself up for success to be able to lead a group of people, whether that's, you know, direct reports or whether that's working together on a team. Uh, kind of moving forward and that's going to kind of pull us right into talking about our team and, and how we kind of came together at the very beginning of this process and we actually sat down before we got into any of the content about past you place or or really trying to understand addiction services or anything like that we, we thought it was really important to kind of baseline ourselves with our team norms and, and create a, a bit of a charter for the project as a whole so we started off with you know what what are we all interested in together um, what are kind of the, the things that we all share uh, passions about or, or interest in the community uh, and we found that you know we have a lot in common we're all doing this program together and we're all really passionate about the community and that's kind of one key kind of interest that, that kind of ground us all, all together and then it was really about how can we actually generate value through this process and, and what kind of key contributions can we all make and, and what are some of the key values that we're looking for out of our team members as we kind of work through this process so we kind of came up with six kind of foundational puzzle pieces, I'll call them, um, that kind of helped intertwine all of our work together. And so we were really open-minded through all of this process. Communication was a massive part, whether it was communication between the team or communication with stakeholders or, or past you place directly. Um, we were also making sure that we're very respectful with one another. We're, we're super open, easy to get along with all of us for sure. Um, adaptable, we'll get into some of the uh, adaptability and, and where that had to come into play as we go through the presentation. Uh, good collaboration amongst the team, kind of a key sum core value right there. And then really committed, so we've all been in this program, we're all here to help pass you place through this project and so that's kind of the, the baseline for our core values of what we're actually working towards here, whether it's just with pass you place or, or through the program as a whole. Um, using those core values, we started to kind of generate what are the norms that we want to, to kind of baseline here for the project. Uh, so whether that was creating um, a meeting cadence so that we could hold each other accountable through the process to make sure that we were hitting deliverables or, or working with the community partners that we needed to, um, we, we did set those. Uh, and then ultimately at the end of the day, we're just here to support one another. This is kind of another task on all of our plates. We're all busy. We all have a main job. We're all working some, some other jobs. Um, and just, you know, having that flexibility and adaptability to really support each other both through the, the CAP project and then through Leadership with Buffalo as a whole. Perfect. So in terms of the project evolution, just like any standard project that anyone's really worked on, it evolves as, as you move on, as we go through the program. And We've seen this through our CAP project uh, for the past two places. We did break it up into four key sections or steps as we call it. Um, the first one at the very start of the program in September of 2021, 20, uh, which we're terming the project kickoff. This is where the team got together and we really established what is the vision for our project, what is our scope and what are some of our key deliverables. Obviously fresh into the program, we were all quite eager and optimistic of what we were going to deliver to past two place and originally we had set out to deliver a final um, medical detox proposal for past two place um, as as thomas mentioned this is where we had to do some slight adaption um, as we move into step two which we're tabling as data collection this was kicked off in november and december of um, 2021 and we had to spend a lot of time collecting data um, what as we mentioned, you know, 
where is the closest medical detox facility? What does a medical detox facility entail? Um, what does Pass Due Place currently have in place? Um, lots of questions, lots of surveys, um, data collection, which quickly allowed us to say, I think we need to put the brakes on and step back. There's no way that the five of us here could deliver a medical proposal to Pass Due Place. Just the skill sets and expertise required on a medical level we did not feel comfortable. Now that being said, um, we still wanted to present or prepare something that we could hand over that would be very beneficial to pass through place on their journey to submitting a uh, medical proposal to AHS. And this is where we really sat down and said, if we cannot provide all the content and details for a medical uh, proposal, what can we give them? So. Um, very, very structured approach. Um, we, we, are, we will be providing Pass Due Place with the framework of a proposal, which is very critical for them and will set them up for success as they continue the journey um, into the medical field. What that will look like is a very clear template of what the proposal should entail. Um, we, we did go ahead and populate quite a few sections for them. Um, we spent a lot of time doing questionnaires with multiple different facilities throughout Alberta that had transitioned from social um, to medical detox. As well, we conducted a lot of needs assessments um, throughout the community on what is the really need here. So we do have quite a few um, deliverables that we can pass over to Pass Due Place and a couple of unique ones that we'll get into that we identified along the way that we could give them that will add some additional value. And then moving into the fourth step here, this is really what we're tabling as project completion, and it's basically post-program. So right now we're at our presentation, graduation is tomorrow. Um, we're going to continue to do some work with Pass Two Place as a team. We've collectively agreed that we want to kind of see this through until the end. So we will continue to help them with their proposal, as well we will be um, meeting with their board of directors in May to present out on um, what we have done for them. So, um, of course, with every project, there is our challenges and our successes. But overall, our team did extraordinarily well working together. And you know, as challenges arose, we were really quick to strategize and come and get over those together, work on a plan. Um, actually, probably the, the most challenging part was probably coming up with the challenges and successes slide for this. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one key initial challenge for us was pertaining to our communication piece. So in, as Lisa just mentioned, in November, December, we started our reaching out to other detox facilities all across the province. This was a little tricky because, you know, given that in November, December, we were coming up on holidays, COVID was still very active, these other facilities were super busy, and so the key contact people were, uh, were a little difficult to get to, to reach and get through to. So, you know, we just, you know, just remain patient and just those respectful nudges and just staying on, on course and we were able to overcome that eventually. And then um, also of course another challenge would be the fact that we had to come to terms with the fact that we are not a team of medical, uh, we're not a medical team, we don't have a specialization in addiction, so just being okay with that and just, um, yeah, just overcoming that hurdle and realizing that we could not deliver the full proposal like we initially had intended. And then, but with the success, as I mentioned, adapting to those uh, the deliverables, changing the deliverables as they went, that was probably one of our biggest success. Um, adding on, adding some key deliverables that we didn't intend on, because there were some opportunities that, that we'll talk about a little bit later. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Just altering the deliverables accordingly and overcoming all so of course, as, as was mentioned, um, the coming together of this project and the proposal development did require pulling on a lot of levers in terms of resources, both in the community and outside of the community. Um, so a couple of the key points here was the community needs assessment. Um, we will take you through the data collection of that needs assessment, but we reached out to um, 28 plus local agencies to get their feedback on what is the real need here for medical detox in the Fort McMurray region. Um, in addition to that, we, we have mentioned some surveys or questionnaires, we'll call it. That's where we reached out to over um, 
13, well we had success, sorry, with over 13 detox centers throughout the Alberta region that had either in, in years past transitioned into medical from a social or just recently and even some that are currently going through the process. Um, that has given us a lot of information that we can give the past to place um, in terms of what were some of their challenges with the medical proposal. Um, you know, what were some of their key resources and a lot of great information that will be very beneficial to them. And then of course, Past Due Place and, and their team, this wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, we've leveraged the executive director, um, Amber, on multiple occasions and she's been nothing but helpful. We had a very, very detailed, um, descriptive tour of the facility, which was very eye-opening. As we mentioned, none of us here had a lot of exposure to what that, um, facility was, um, so that was that was very helpful. So as Janelle and Lisa mentioned, we had a lot of collaboration and connection with um, other detox facilities and local agencies, um, both provincially and locally, um, so their, their input to our program really was so beneficial, we couldn't have compiled the information that we had, that we have now for the proposal, if it weren't for their um, willingness to give us information, I guess. They, they shared a lot of information about their own personal transitions from social to medical detoxes and what their proposals to AHS looked like. So we were really lucky to connect with some of those people as well as the local, uh, the local organizations providing us with real needs for this community and how they see the medical detox facility really benefiting our community. So we talked about the needs assessment, that's really what kind of set the stage for is this project actually required? Do we need a medical detox facility in our community or is the social detox facility that Past You Place currently has sufficient? And so one of the first questions we asked those, those 28 uh, agencies that we reached out to is have you referred any clients to Past You Place in the past? And given the, the agencies that we reached out to, some wouldn't be in the process of referring clients. So about 67% of the agencies actually have referred clients in the past to pass you place. But the real kicker question here is, is a medical detox uh, facility required? Uh, and respondents, yes, 100%, definitely, absolutely. Basically, 100% yes. Everyone who responded to the survey, just a big circle didn't seem cool enough to put up a A resounding yes, a medical facility hyper acquired by uh, the community and the region as a whole. Again, like, like we mentioned, it, this is the only facility north of, uh, of, of Edmonton, so uh, there is definitely a need here. And then as part of the process of, of generating that proposal to, to hand over to Passview Place, we wanted to try and give them an idea of how many clients would they be expecting to see come through their doors on a regular basis so that they can try and understand you know, what sort of programming are they going to offer. They're gonna fully transition to medical and, and remove some of their social beds, or is there going to be some form of division? And there is a bit of a split in terms of expectations of, of how many people are going to be coming, but uh, ultimately uh, one to two, and, and, and some agencies actually said up to 10 uh, a month would be uh, referred to the programming. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those additional deliverables that we provide. So the original key thing that we wanted to bring to Passy Place was that proposal framework, as well as the data from these assessments. And as we went along this journey, we identified, well, we had some very creative and, and unique strengths in our team, mainly Thomas with his photography expertise. Uh, we were able to offer Passy Place, if you've seen it on the, the real estate postings, if you're in the market, uh, you see these fancy layouts for the for your, for the homes and the square footage and everything. Uh, so Thomas was able to do one of those for the past you place organization because in previous uh, proposals, they include four floor plans, emergency uh, response plans. Uh, it's part of like, hey, the, we we have our our business in order here. We like we fund us for for what we're asking here. Like we're so they the, the layout is a really cool uh, addition that we were able to provide as well as uh, a, a logo, and I'll, I'll pass it over to Thomas to talk about what we're proposing there. Yeah, so like we mentioned, the Past Few Place has been around since 1979. They've been around for 42 years, and, and they actually had a logo that was initially designed by one of their past clients, and uh, they use this logo for, for everything, but it's starting to get a, a little bit dated, and, and they don't actually have any high-resolution files of it anymore. This is kind of it, so it starts to get a little pixelated, 
And as we were starting to try and prepare some of their proposal documents and, and give them that framework that we're looking to hand over, um, kind of realized maybe there's something else that we can do here is just kind of a nice little side benefit. So we've actually gone ahead and, and designed them a new logo that we, we've got a couple options. This is the one that we, we kind of like the most, but we're, we're going to take it to the, the board of directors in, in May and, and, and ultimately they can decide whether they, they want to keep their old logo, adopt this or, or change it. But um, we're just kind of helping do some of that work that, that they don't necessarily have the time to do because they're focused on the, the things that, that they need to be focused on, which is their clients. And we're trying to do some of that background work for them. So hopefully the, the house theme still carries through with the building, the helping hands, the, the community piece in the center. We've tried to pull in a lot of those elements from their previous logo, um, but really make it uh, a little more flashy and, and easy to see um, what, what they're up to. So what's next? Um, so Pass Two Place is currently in the process of get, doing their social detox accreditation. Uh, once that is completed, they will take our framework proposal, that development that we uh, will pass into them, and they'll finalize that by adding any of the additional like medical policies and any of that pertinent information that needs to go in there that we have not been able to provide. So they will then take that and uh, the final proposal document will be sent into AHS in 2023. And uh, like Lisa said, we will continue to kind of uh, work with Pass Two Place after this to make sure you know all the liberals have been met, it's been delivered, and we will present to, to the board of directors as well. Um, we have been very hopeful that you know the framework that we were able to put together, the proposal development, is you know as we took it as far as we could take it with our knowledge, and that the goal was that Pass Two Place would have to do minimal work when it comes to the final submission to AHS. And so yeah. So I guess in terms of some key takeaways for, for the team, uh, we collectively agreed on both you know, learning from a, a professional um, standpoint as well as a personal development standpoint. Um, lots of eye opening as we mentioned in the community, what's out there, what needs are there, where we can help as um, leaders, as well, you know, what, what is past two place? That was, that was huge for us, just understanding that, seeing where we can help um, and then the program in itself, and I'll actually let Jenna speak to the program piece. Yeah, so uh, a little while ago we were having a working session and we just kind of went around the table and we were like, what, is, what are your key takeaways? What do you feel like you gained the most from this program? And the one thing that was consistent throughout all of us was the, the amount of self-awareness and understanding and self-reflection and just being able to look inwards. and. This program has challenged us all in so many different ways, on so many different levels. It's been uncomfortable, we've been vulnerable, we've had to meet 20 new people and just kind of throw ourselves into this space, being like, this is who I am, take it or leave it. <laughs> and everyone took it. Like, everyone in our cohort and our group has been so safe to speak to these things with and make mistakes and overcome hardships and even things that are going on in our personal lives, looking forward to these learning days has just been like so great. Um, yeah, okay, so we just wanted to thank all of you for being here and listening to us and all the work we've been doing the past few months and thank you Sherry and Colin for your dedication to the program and really allowing for us all to come together in the space that we've been in and to the rest of our cohort members You've all been amazing. And yeah, thank you. It's been a great year. Any questions? <laughs> now I guess we'll open the floor to any questions that anyone might have. Anyone? How do you guys know where to start with your templates? Your proposal Oh, I can I can pick that one. Sure. Um, so that kind of leads back to when we mentioned the questionnaires with the detox facilities throughout Alberta, um, which which was definitely hard to begin. Like I said, getting in contact with those key key members of each of the, each of the different facilities. Um, but we were actually quite well. We framed up. I think it was 20 plus questions that we asked each facility, um, all unique questions, and we compiled all the information, which was very helpful to see. Okay, what are some of the key sections? What you know, what are some of the challenges? What does the proposal need? Is there a template from AHS we didn't know, right? Maybe AHS has, here is 
what you need to submit for medical. Um, we, they, they do not actually believe it or not, they don't have that. But we got very lucky and actually Alpha House, they, gave, they had given us their submission. They are just in the final sa stages, sorry, of obtaining that medical status. So we were able to take that and build on that one. And Pass Through Place will have a, a hard copy of that proposal so that they can use. Okay, so during your pro progress, you said that um, your project it wasn't going the way that it was planned. So do you want to, can you kind of share, I guess, like the process of how you work through, that's a pretty big stumbling block in the leadership of Buffalo program, and you know, the idea that what you dreamed is no longer going to be what it's supposed to be, how did you work through that process? And I guess come to terms with it. Yeah, I think like, Going into this, I had no background in, in dealing with anything addictions or detox. Some of our other group members have had family members that have gone through the process, so I was coming in completely blind. Um, and then as we started to go through the Alpha House proposal and we're looking and like, I don't even know what a nurse practitioner is versus a nurse, so it was just us trying to work through those kind of background steps that we were like, we actually don't know like what sort of storage container you need for medication. We don't know what the different different pay bands for nurses are. We just don't have that background. So going into it, we were like, yeah, we're gonna give them an org structure. We're gonna tell them how many nurses they need. And then as we started to try and work through that, we're like, we don't actually, we're, we're not the experts in this field. And we would do a disservice to pass you place if we went through that process and said, you need three nurses and this, and they're like, that's, that's not true at all. You guys are way off the mark. So realizing that as we were starting to work through, it was kind of at the same time that we were starting to realize, hey, there's some actual additional deliverables that we can give them. Uh, and so we kind of put our effort into those and it was kind of an easy transition to say, you know what, we're going to give them all of the tools to make it super easy for them to fill in all of that medical information that they already know. Um, and we'll just provide them the template. It's all right there. They can drop that information in, but we've done all of the hard work of creating all of the documents for them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see because, and I think largely for most of the other social profits or even any organization, like as, it was almost like a light, light bulb, like, like just a little bit like, well, the, the important part here is the data, the organization, us just helping them in their journey. They're so busy. They're also so passionate about the cause. It, it's like, any help that we give them to organize their data, to get them ready for that step in 2023, it, it was like, that's, that's where the value is. We don't have to go tell them how many nurses need to, need to be on shift. If we, we show them what the framework is, we organize the data, that is really where we can help it out. And I think that's the same for all these organizations in the community. Everybody's so busy just trying to get by. I think it's, if, if that's where we can lend a hand to help out, that's, I think, the, where the value is. I think I will add one, one key thing is we, acknowledge it right up front. Um, very early, as you've seen in the timeline in our project, and we didn't let it stumble. Like, we, we, we recognize it, we, we can't do this, and we figured out ways to adapt, and what can we deliver. So I think that was very key, and not giving up, and like you said, sitting down as a team, getting Amber, the executive director, on board with us, and saying, well, what about these other deliverables? Will that add value? And, and as Jordan mentioned, like she was blown away and more than thankful that anything we could deliver to that team was above and beyond for them. So. really appreciate the, the, the how you started off your group talking about establishing values um, and as well as you know the, one of the one of the big takeaways here is the adaptability to the process you, you kind of just spoke about that if, if you did it again what would you do different Ooh, loaded question <laughs> I think when we first went to Past You Place, we sat down with Amber um, and it was just like a fire hose of information. Um, and I think if we would have gone back a few more times and tried to take that in smaller bits, we would have had, we probably would have came to that conclusion that we don't actually have the background to do what we thought we were going to do in the beginning. We would have got over that hurdle and maybe there's, there's more deliverables that we could have kind of roped into all of that. Um, that we didn't, you know, we didn't, we just didn't have time to because we discovered those additional deliverables in January or February. But if we would have kind of been able to get over that initial hurdle of being so eager to help them to do this 
we're going to do the whole document and you're just going to send what we send you right to AHS and you're going to get it. If we would have just gotten over that probably a little sooner, I think that would have been. I think too, if we had to, like you said, we, we went into that session with Amber, uh, uh, the tour of the facility very early on in the project. Maybe if we had to frame up some questions, some key questions that we could have asked her during that initial session, it might have highlighted, like to your point, it was more very, hey, this is what past due place is, this is our facility, these are the programs. And we didn't really get into a level of project type questions. To your point, it was like a fire hose of information. And it took us probably three, four weeks to go through that as a team to say, what do we want to go back to Amber with now? Maybe if, if I had to do it different, I would have framed up maybe some questions, or that would be my recommendation to any future cohorts prior to any of those initial um, meetings with the uh, nonprofits or whomever your project is with. You referenced writer presentation um, many times as a self-reflection in the world. Um, and you're all leaders in your own right and you've had your experience experiences. What would you say was your greatest uh, learning in terms of what you do? I think for me personally, I think I've learned that it's such a balancing thing. Um, there's so much self reflect I hope I'll say the word again, self reflection, but I did not realize like when originally kind of like what Thomas mentioned earlier, going in and thinking about a leadership role, you like I picture like bullet point things where you you know, you follow a process and everything is just like, like this, like this, like this. But it was none of that where it was like you know, I had to stop and like you're just doing that inner work like throughout all and I've already like I'm you know now when it happens in the workplace I'm like oh there it is mm -hmm. so it's like that the, the self to stop the awareness the pauses that tend to happen now after this program that for me is the learning it's just yeah that's that pause to self-reflect is definitely for me I think it's um you don't need to have the title of a leader to be a leader um this cohort had multiple different um members, right? Some were leaders, some were not leaders. Um, we had oil and gas, we had nonprofit, and it's funny, like, no matter where you are in your career or who you're working for, we all have the same struggles and hardships and when it comes to leadership and it's, for me, that was the biggest, like, it's that you don't need the title in order to step up and be a leader or to be a leader in the community or a leader in your workplace, um, which was, for, for me, something that I can bring back to my team. You know, a lot of people get very intimidated by leaders or if they're in the room or if they don't have that title, but that, that doesn't matter. We're, we are all leaders in one way or another, and that was one of my key key takeaways. The community leadership piece, like it's being open, empathetic, caring about other people, and I think that's where I, I, I want to grow as a, as a person and see it's, it's more than just myself and my team. It's, it's how is the community, because it, one, one takeaway that we had was Industry is, is doing its thing, and then you have community. The community is also going to do it. Both need to succeed to, to really to have longevity and, and be sustainable. And, and I think that's where it's you just we need to care. You need to be open and empathetic. And I think that's those are some of the key leadership takeaways. I think I realized too that not everyone that you come in contact with is going to receive your leadership in the same way, and you have to adjust based on people's past experiences and who they are as people. So I don't think there's one way to do it for everyone. I think you have to be adaptable and empathetic and understanding of other people's experiences and that was a big one for me. And if I reflect and you know coming up through the cadet program and, and directly in the military, leadership in the military is very different than what we think of in terms of community leadership and I reflect on that and I think about a very top down military style of leadership and, and how how some of that transfers over into a community space but how we need to and how I've seen over the last few years the shift into more uh, community focused leadership where like we mentioned we're all kind of working together from within and it's less about that one leader from the top pulling the group along and it's the leader within helping everyone move along together is kind of the, the key piece for me. Next up is the Early Years Coalition Project, or as they like to be called, the Breakfast Club. In this group we have Kara Bolton, Martin Virahanga, Josh Hepperin, Gula Malik, and Josh Splane. Wow.
welcome Breakfast Club. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, as, as Sherry mentioned, we are the Breakfast Club, and, and welcome to our presentation on the Early Years Coalition. Uh, but before I do get started off, though, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to everybody in the audience for being here today. Not, not only to listen to our presentation and support us, but for supporting the RMWB and, and Fuse Social, who has worked so hard behind the scenes to make that possible. And special shout out to Mr. Colin Funk and Sherry McKecker, who have made this look suspiciously easy, which means that they worked really, really hard behind the scenes to bring this all to life. So thank you all very, very much. So as you can tell, Jordan Ratzlaff and I, we did get the same memo last night. We are dressed in the official attire for anybody who opens Leadership with Buffalo presentations today. And much like the agenda that you previously listened to, we're going to be going through our CAP project on the Early Years Coalition, what that process looked like, what did we learn as a team, what challenges did we face, and what did we learn along the way. But before that, what is this? breakfast club thing all about and how do you work these clickers properly? <laughs> so the breakfast club, like how did that name come about? So it was seven months ago back in September of 2021 when you know, the universe brought us five together. You'll notice one of our members is not here today. Unfortunately he is very ill so in the spirit of inclusivity we're going to bring him to you virtually today. So we'll see how that goes, no promises, but we will absolutely do our best. So one of those five team members is a bit of an early riser, and somebody said, it was me, let's get together at seven o'clock uh, in the morning on Sundays. Now, thankfully, the rest of my teammates being much more reasonable, much more rational, said like, Josh, no, like, that's way too early, we're, we're not gonna do it. So we compromised, and we ended up getting together at nine o'clock in the morning on Sundays. So to live up to the moniker of the Breakfast Club, we definitely did get breakfast together, and it brought us together closer as a team. Uh, so, so to start off our introductions here, I'm going to hand over to the very special person that oftentimes made breakfast happen, Miss Kara Bolton. So I'm Kara Bolton, I'm a program manager with the YMCA, and I've actually lived in Fort McMurray for about 20 years now. So came up for a five-year plan, like, pretty much half of Fort McMurray did, and 20 years later raised my four children. Um, leadership with Buffalo has been fantastic. Um, and we've heard comments from the previous group. I think all of us have reached something that we really gained differently, and I'm honestly just proud to be a part of it. And this told her, and I did not get the blue memo, so. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Josh Heffern. I'm the Mobile Pantry Coordinator for the Wood Buffalo Food Bank. Born and raised here in Fort McMurray. Um, I've been doing this role for about nine months. I have an oil field background and uh, couldn't be happier to be a part of this. Hi, I'm Martin Diarhanger. I work with the Regional Inspector of Wood Buffalo, Culture and Social Development. I have been Fort McMurray since 2016. The World Fire brought me here and I like the community. I have grown my family here in Port Macquarie. I like working with the community. I like studying uh, public. And uh, my takeaway from the leadership with both our course is learning from the heart. As a leader, that's what was my biggest takeaway from the program. And uh, thanks for the facilitators and the co-facilitators of the program for making this smooth. We all appreciate and. Uh, Wishing the best for the rest of the program. I encourage whoever has not taken our agenda, it's a great program. <laughs> All right, so I'll take the honor here of introducing our teammate who made the hard choice, but the right choice to not be here today, and that is Mr. Gulen Malik. So, so Gulen is also employed with, with Suncor Energy here. He works in the mine reliability group where I know he does a lot of fantastic work in the reliability space and data analytics, which he was able to bring to our breakfast club along the way here. And lastly, my name is, is Josh Blaine, as I already mentioned. I, I've been lucky enough to be with Suncor Energy 
for almost 10 years. May 14th is the big day. It's coming up pretty soon here. And I've all, also been lucky enough to be in Fort McMurray since 2014. Prior to that, unlike a lot of other folks here, I'm actually not from Newfoundland. Uh, I'm from the Middle East, otherwise known as Ontario. So it's, you know, it's kind of on that other side there. Uh, but, but it's been an absolute pleasure to spend the last, uh, the last several years in Fort McMurray where I've, I became a husband, I became a father, and I'm slowly but surely growing into my new pair of leadership shoes. So, uh, so with that, I wanted to get into the Early Years Coalition a little bit. Like, show of hands in the room, who's ever heard of the Early Years Coalition before this very moment? We do have some hands, admittedly more than I thought. That, that's fantastic news. And, and for anybody who might not have heard about it before, that's okay. I admittedly, I didn't hear about it before I took on the project. But it was one near and dear to my heart, because I have a little five-year-old running around at home. So the Early Years Coalition is a group of very talented people, no surprise there, parents, community leaders, educators, caregivers, who've all come together with their passion of our children and our youth here in the region. And with that passion, they intentionally make those oh-so-important connections in the community. They grow the community's knowledge and skills to ensure that the next generation, our kids, our youth, right here in the RMWB, have that oh so important foundation so that for the rest of their lives, they've got the physical skill set, they've got the mental tools to be wonderful community leaders one of these days. So with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to my teammate, Martin, to go over a little bit about the process and the journey that we undertook here. All right, thanks Josh, and uh, maybe you're going to be my other hand to use the clicker as you're checking the slides as we go along. As we've been introduced with the introductions for the coalition, we had uh, a number of asks uh, to be done with from Arias coalition. Our ask, the proposal at first was uh, a little not clear to the extent that uh, we will be on the question back and forth. So what we did, uh, we reviewed the proposal by uh, reviewing the membership, uh, mission, vision, terms of references, that was part of the proposal. Uh, another piece uh, that we were inquired to look into was to updating the future plan of the coalition. And uh, we were also asked to support building a sustainable model as we, as the coalition, continue to grow and to help into looking at the tools that will support the coalition for recruiting new members. So those were part of the proposal as we figured out uh, alongside the, the journey within our last six months of the proposal. Um, right. Turning down my own. Okay. <laughs> so as long alongside the, the journey through our process with the stakeholder alias coalition stakeholders, as we reviewed our proposal, our breakfast team or breakfast club, I always refer back to both to a team and a club. Uh, we figured out a uh, couple of uh, priorities, which are include the identifying the IS coalition. Is, is it necessary? Is it of the value in the community? Obviously, that includes the, the needs assessment. We need the coalition. Another priority that we looked into was to, what should be the election and purpose. That was highlighted within the proposal that was on the table. Um, about the direction and the purpose of the coalition. Uh, we identify, uh, identifying and building a sustainable model as uh, how sustainable is this coalition going to run. As we know in the community or in the world of social profit, we have uh, networks, coalitions, which is a cooperative of different other organizations. They literally run on any finances, so it is a volunteer basis that was 
what could be the sustainable model for this coalition. Identifying and recruiting new members, as we were asked into looking for tools on how the coalition can identify and recruit new members or voices that are not on the table as currently as uh, we go forward. Our next priority included creating an action plan. So once we do all that, recruiting new members, having a sustainable model, what are we working on anyway? Why and uh, what activities can we get and get into so that we can remain on the coalition? Um, another priority was to update the current IAS coalition documents. And as we all know, each and every organization they have a structure and guiding documents. And in this case, we will go into details as we go along with uh, some of the documents uh, as part of our deliverables for the program. So, as we dive in in our integrated process as Breakfast Club and the areas coalition stakeholders, we had a couple number of process items as uh, illustrated on our slide. You may not notice an arrow showing a direction on which we took, but that is intentional because it was uh, a learning process for the areas coalition for some of our members uh, with uh, less uh, knowledge, understanding of the social profit as we learn and uh, certain at a later time they will be talking about what was their take from the project. As I go through the analytical chart of us, we established our team's norm and uh, one of my colleagues will talk about the team's norms and our team's uh, what we did best that kept us as anchor or kept us together through this project. Um, we met our stakeholders, areas coalition stakeholders, which uh, uh, proposed to be called, called what with RWB, the Federal Inspector of the and uh, Samantha from the Family Resource, uh, AHA, Family Resource Center. We met with them and we had a chat about uh, exactly what we could deliver that helped the team to uh, act promptly and catch up with our pace with the limited time we had in all our delivery posts that we were required. And uh, maybe that will, yeah, that will answer someone's question if it is there on how we maneuvered over our timelines. We met with the team, uh, the stakeholders right away in time, and we had a clarity on what we had to work on and what we had to deliver. Once we got the clarity about our project and our delivery board, we had to go through a project timeline. And uh, through this, it included a number of tools uh, where we had to set uh, analytical processes and uh, other systems in place to help us in having a number of experiences and expertise on the table from engineers, uh, from social profit world, from myself, we used uh, project management uh, system and the tools in press, a girl chart, uh, we set our milestones, and, and we celebrated accomplishments as a team because we need that energy. You need it in the organization as well. Um, our next process, as after setting up our timelines, and uh, we were able to jump in doing our best practices of uh, benchmarking and research. Um, here we had to look into what are other coalitions in Alberta do. They are about 100 coalitions across the province. Among out of 100, we looked keenly in eight, um, eight coalitions that are similar size from similar sized communities. We learned a lot from the literature, from what other community coalitions do and what would collect with what uh, Alias Coalition for McMurray does, which included community engagement, collaboration, enhancing synergies, um, which we are comfortable and confident to say that after we did our focus groups and our study internally here within the community, that the findings correlate with what other communities do. We went ahead to uh, understanding in correlation of the results from what we found out from research and benchmark to what exactly 
is on the ground through, the work, through our survey. We developed a survey which included a number of questions that helped us to understand what is alias coalition, what is missing within the on the table, how can this coalition be sustainable. Um, we wanted to understand our current members, what are they benefiting from the coalition, what more can they bring to the coalition to help to figure out on building a sustainable model and how other members or individuals can participate. We, display, we administered uh, a survey from uh, current active coalition members and other previous uh, coalition members within the community. The channel was uh, not satisfactory, but it was we were able to get uh, results and draw recommendations from the survey where we analyzed the data and we presented the data to the focus group. We had a focus group after the survey was done and we presented our data that was collected with our recommendations from the findings where we had to collect our benchmark studies and the findings from the survey. As we went ahead, we were to define from our past vision, mission, and we redefine the purpose of what alias coalition is. I think, uh, I remember from that, I can read our new refreshed purpose for our alias coalition. It reads, um, the coalition is to collaborate, promote programs and services in LNWB while advocating for children development needs. That is a new redefined purpose for what ALIAS coalition stands at now, as we speak. Um, we reviewed all the deliverables that we were to deliver as we've been meeting weekly, monthly, in person, virtually, and all our deliverables are complete and we are confident to say that we've been in touch with the ALIAS coalition stakeholders and the appreciative of the projects that we deliver. As we mentioned earlier, that one of our members is not here. We are going to bring him virtually. I think uh, Josh, you can. Uh, this this will be my first ever public attempt to virtually bring a team yes. in. So bear with me. If all goes sideways, Sherry, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you for a little help here. So we'll see how this goes. I'll ask All right. To not be As much too rapid right. through the process we followed within the last eight months or so, I'd like to. All right, Sherry. Now I need your help. Maybe getting this slide. This. Okay. <laughs> So one of our teammates fell ill quite suddenly, and he, he absolutely did the, the right thing, but the hard thing in electing to not be here today. So I must give Gulen credit. He, he took the initiative to put together a video presentation of, of his part and uploaded it for us yesterday. So I could try to butcher the hyperlink into our presentation. So that's what you're experiencing right now is my butchery and Sherry trying to fix it up for me. So. Thank you for your patience. Um, where did you find the video? Yeah. Oh, so you just go down and should be click on files oh, here maybe. Oh. Yeah, this one right there at the bottom. All right. So As Martin walked us through the process. So if not, what we can do is play the audio here, and I'll put through it up there if I yes. can work too. It's really okay. Yeah, just play here. So we're going to play the audio from the laptop, so I'm going to ask everybody, please don't be too rowdy because it's only a little laptop speakers, and I'll try to click through it as we go. I'm sure it'll be, it'll be seamless. All right. As Martin walked us through the process we followed within the last eight months or so, I'd like to highlight some of the agencies on the left-hand side which we ended up engaging with as a part of our community action project. Personally, I'm from oil sands background, um, and there were some which I didn't even know they existed. But in a nutshell, engagement with these agencies resulted in a valuable learning experience. However, our level of community experience was not limited uh, to the list on the left-hand side. We gained some valuable insight into some of the agencies through our learning based speaker series. As evident from their logos, Multicultural Associ Multicultural Association, Fuse Social, 
SPCA, the Salvation Army, uh, St. Aiden Society, and Good Buffalo Volunteer Center, they took time out of their busy schedules to walk us through the excellent work they're doing for our community. Uh, next, I'd like to walk you through the evolution of our project. Uh, since it's not as complicated as evolution of human beings, we don't have to discuss Darwin's theory of evolution today at all. So when we took over this challenge, we did have a clear understanding of the problem statement and deliverables. So the first thing we did is that we set up a session with relevant stakeholders, such as uh, EYC co-chairs. The session helped us clearly define our problem statement as well as the deliverable, <coughs> excuse me, as well as the deliverables to EYC. Uh, once we knew our end goal, we created a work breakdown structure set up major milestones and created a catch all right as martin walked us through the process we followed within the last eight months or so i'd like to highlight this guy but in a nutshell engagement with these agencies resulted in a valuable learning However, our level of community experience was not limited. Let's go back to the presentation and we'll Okay. Go back to the presentation, sorry. A little bit of technical difficulties. Thanks for bearing Sorry, with us. Folks. We'll just add we'll see how we can do it here. So, as as Gulam was explaining from his house uh, up in Timberley right now, uh, we obviously had a project evolution, and, and much like the process that Martin already alluded, alluded to, it was multifaceted and it was iterative. We we absolutely learned along the way. So, uh, at first, a, a bit of a vague understanding. That's completely normal. Uh, the early years coalition reached out to us with a problem definition and much like some of my cohort members, uh, we didn't have that innately deep understanding of how the social pro profit sectors work. So we reached out to the early years coalition and sat with their co-chairs to try to better understand like, who are they as a coalition, what is their purpose, what's the value they bring, and that really helped us clarify and define uh, where we needed to go and what our deliverables needed to be for this project. Uh, once we had our clearly defined our, our problem statement, opportunity, if you will, uh, then it was really time to, to get to work. And this is where it was, it was kind of a beautiful thing to watch, where you had the engineers on the team that were adamant that like, we need Gantt charts, we need that kind of structure, we gotta know what we're gonna do for the next six months. And then you had some other team members with a completely different skill set that was like, okay, Gantt charts are great, but here's what you actually need to do. We know how the social profit and the nonprofit works, and that's where I will eternally be grateful to my team members who absolutely educated me along the way here. So, what were our, what were our deliverables like? At the end of the day, what were we able to? How were we able to provide value to the EYC? So that came in a couple different forms. Uh, one of them was a good old-fashioned PowerPoint slide deck, and this slide deck was used with a focus group to really hone in on the new purpose for the EYC that Martin shared with everybody, as well as some really tactical goals. Like a purpose is great, but what, what tactics do we employ to actually get there, to, to build that membership, to make sure that the community knows of the value that the Early Years Coalition provides? We updated a, a new report and the benchmarking that, that Martin Mayaranga did for us. And we were also able to update the memorandum of understanding as well as terms of reference. Uh, the, the great thing about this was like there was already a previous framework in place for the early years coalition. Uh, like a lot of us, like a lot of organizations, COVID was just hard and we just needed that refresh due to COVID to realign purpose and make sure that we're adding value back to the community. So, after graduation, it's always important to make sure like, these things don't die. They continue to live and breathe and keep making their MWB 
what it is today. So the, our, our project is completed, our deliverables have been handed into the Early Years Coalition. Uh, so the, the Early Years Coalition is going to get together as a group, it's now in the co-chair's hands to really look at those tactics, understand the new reframed purpose, and make sure everybody's really living that new purpose and pulling in the same direction. And, and lastly, they'll take a look at the action plan and all the recommendations that were listed out in it and figure out what are the right ones for them to employ today with the resources that they have available. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Joshua Heffern to talk about some of, like, some of the things that went great over the course of our last seven months and some of the things that maybe weren't so great. So what we learned about ourselves and our team needs. A theme really resonated with us uh, the, closer, uh, the closer we got as a cohort and what their uh, core was that we all had our own private struggles and we all opened up about these and learned and leaned into those vulnerable conversations. Many of us had the same struggles with the same problems and challenges regarding our profession or type, regardless of our profession or titles. This knowledge help, uh, help us feel less broken and understand that we are all imperfect humans tr trying to do better. Sitting down with our cohort members and having those conversations about leadership at times and personal challenges in the community made us feel less alone, hopeful, and hopeful that we can work together as, when we indeed make the world a better place. Which, do I get to the next slide? This one. What went well? For our team, we really strive to have an effective communication, and we knew this would be a huge part for our success. One unique attribute to, of our team was the ability to brainstorm when we needed to get a clear and objective, and our ability to take that clarity and delegate into action items to our team members, free and clear of ego. We all understood that we were all part of something bigger than ourselves between not only our team, but the EYC members. Trust, a big shout out to Sherry and Colin and Few Social for helping us create and establish that dynamic. As a team, we had no fear of looking stupid. We created a safe space as we question, as we could ask questions and put ourselves into those vulnerable conversations. And a huge shout out for Kara for always having us being on the ball and having a meeting space for us every week when we could. And some challenges. What didn't go well? Like anyone else, COVID was in effect for everyone. Uh, many of us were very pressured for our time over the year with COVID and the impact of our workplace and families' lives. Uh, heavily personal workloads. Uh, most of us nine to five. Ideally, your work's not done at five. So you know, we tried to really put that effect and meet our group priorities. And uh, one of some of the things that didn't go well was a low focus group turnout. It wasn't as high as that we would have liked and a low percentage of co coalition members participated in the survey, but we did get a lot of great feedback from the people that did participate. But through that all, we divided and we conquered through everything. So our team had a lot of successes. Um, as a team, as a cohort, um, we kind of married our engineers with our social profits. We provided each other a lot of support, a lot of key learnings about what each of our sectors do, and I think we really came to a better understanding that as a leader of our community, geography of where you work didn't really matter. We had the same focus, we had the same commitment, same dedication. Um, and we were a fun team, because who wouldn't want to have breakfast at nine, <laughs> nine o'clock Sunday morning? Um, we structured our meetings, and our engineers definitely kept our social profits heads out of the sky. So we always had a vision, and we always had a focus. We didn't really celebrate our successes, I think we trusted each other, we guided each other what we needed to do, and I think at the end of the day, we were successful, we completed our projects. On the project end, Early Years Coalition had agreed to redefine what they were doing. So they lost their funding, and they wanted to really understand, is there value to continue in the community? Absolutely. The research approved it, the focus group approved it, and my colleagues, we helped them design the recommendations of how they could proceed. During the focus group, they actually voted and redefined their age group. Early Years Coalition originally was zero to six, 
they are now going to bring everyone together from 0 to 18, which is actually along the provincial recommendation for the family resource networks. So that's huge. The other thing is, is they actually are not going to be Fort McMurray specific. They're going to also be rural inclusive. So that's great too. So um, previously, rural had its own early years coalition, and we believe it's been kind of disbanded. So they have a lot of work to do. So as we had said, we presented them the stage of what they could do, and they're going to continue having conversations and recommendations. We also gave them a list of active members that they could draw into their groups, and I think they're pretty excited of what we're, where they're going to go. I'm personally excited because Early Years Coalition fits within one of my programs, so I'll have a dedication and commitment to see where it's going to go in the future. So, what has changed? Well, everything in the last seven months. <laughs> Um, we all have an increased understanding of social sectors. We have an increased understanding of um, how our colleagues at site work. We have a different understanding of what leadership is. We learn different tools through our learning sessions to kind of bring things together. And we're able to practice some of those techniques and tools that we gained through Leadership with Buffalo Learning Days over the last seven months. There has been a lot of struggles like everybody with COVID and work and high work demand. So having these tools is really beneficial. We also increased our trust with each other. Um, we all have different backgrounds, we all have different lives, we all have different kid issues. And I think the reason why we were so successful is because we really relied on each other and supported each other. And that just really helped our project along. It developed our experience of our community understanding a lot. We all came away with personal growth, an increased awareness and understanding of the community, links between social profit and industry, and obviously, reflection is the key word for today. We really enjoyed our guest speakers that came to speak to us during our leadership um, learning days as well, because the theme was to lead by example, and I think at the end of the day, that's all we'd like to do. So I'm gonna bring it to Josh to take us home. Thank you. <coughs> This has been a journey. And like every journey, you've got to start and you've got an end. And generally speaking, you know where you start from and you know where you're trying to go. But you don't always know what happens in between and much like every other journey, we learn some things along the way that we didn't expect to learn. So 2021, it was kind of hard. Like, let's face it, during COVID, there was some dark times, for lack of a better word. But in September, a little flicker, a little beacon of hope that maybe none of us really realized at first. And that beacon of hope was Leadership Wood Buffalo. Uh, again, you, you, you've heard about the trust. Colin, Sherry, they're like master like seamstresses and they, and they intricately wove these patterns and these engagements that build the trust in, in our cohort. And the indelible lesson left on us all was that when you lean in to vulnerability and when you step into trust, like, there is nothing that we cannot overcome as a community. So, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we, we opened with a round of thank yous. And again, there's a lot of gratitude in this room today. I wanna close with another round of thank yous. So in no particular order, thank you to the Early Years Coalition for bringing forward like such an interesting and engaging community action project. We, we all learned something along the way that we'll carry with us forever. And then thank you to all of the agencies, people, and organizations that sponsored us to be here. So like, shout out to Few Social, again, they, they set it up at all, you can see their banners here. The things that they do for our community are absolutely wonderful. Fort McMurray Food Bank for sponsoring Mr. Joshua Heffern's time to be here. Suncor Energy, uh, you've absolutely supported me to be here, which I will forever be grateful, as well as, as Gulen, who again couldn't be here today. I know we've both learned so much along the way. The Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo for sponsoring Martin to be here with us. And last, but certainly not least, the YMCA of Northern Alberta, without whom we would not have this terrible. So thank you very much for everybody, and thank you for listening.
As you can tell, Kara is eager. Please direct all your questions, sir. Let's do it. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, we mentioned that uh, you didn't get enough uh, participation in the uh, focus group. Was it just due to COVID or any, are there any lessons to be done? That? I can take, do I'll take that one on. So the early years, early years coalition two years ago had a membership of between 45 and 56 members consistently. Um, over COVID, they definitely had to redefine childcare, $25 daycare, childcare was a huge impact, and a lot of the conversation <coughs> totally focused on that childcare. A lot of the membership was dropped off. We did reach out to everybody, um, asking if they'd be part of our survey, invited them to our focus group. I think we had about 13 respond, and out of those 13, they were pretty much the general people who continued on for the last two years. Um, I think we had about 16 questions on our focus group, uh, survey and it really covered a broad range about issues, why people were coming, and I think the data, even though it was a very small segment, was very beneficial to really where they wanted to steer for. They just felt like they were lost, and through the data, it really came clear that they needed to make a change in order to continue to be sustainable. Okay. So, fascinated by the strategic vision that you Some of the aha moments might have been different for each and every one of us, like given our life experiences. Uh, I, I've been li living and breathing industry for a decade now, and I, you can ask uh, Kara, Josh, Martin. Like, I asked a lot of questions, like, what is a social profit? And, like, what, what is a nonprofit? And how are they different? Because I just lived and breathed Suncorp for the last decade, and one of my aha moments that finally clicked was when I understood there's these kind of like universal laws that are applicable, regardless of if you're for-profit, you're non-profit. Like leadership is still leadership. People still need to understand the purpose, they still need to understand the why, and they still need to be aligned with their belief in building a better future. And, and once that really clicked for me, that these these laws which I've applied at some point are also applicable to the non-profit, I felt that I personally was really able to like mentally switch gears and add more value to our project. So that was, that was one of my uh, moments. Um, for me, working in social profit, I think the last couple of years of COVID have definitely weighed pretty heavily on all of our shoulders and our programs. Being able to provide direct good services to the community virtually and having to redefine. Um, the early years coalition itself had gone through that same type of experience. Um, and they were really at the place of understanding like without funding can they continue to go is there a need and I think what made it really good for us is once we met with Samantha and Nicole and really understood from the paper proposal to really what they were looking it really came to a really clear direction which then we were all able to contribute and then with the findings that we found it just kind of re-solidified why it's important for social profit to be so in touch with the community how can you adapt how can you change um, I think it would be a shame for early years to disband, and I think it'll be great if they do continue and change their name to like the Youth Coalition or Youth Interagency, because it's needed. Our community needs it. Our youth are hurting. Mental health of our youth are hurting. Myself, uh, my aha moment, as we talked about our group norms and uh, values, is when we had a couple different perspectives, and we all built in to reach an agreement, an agreeable point of where do we see ourselves as leaders and how do we tackle different uh, uh, ideologies and perspectives. And we built in my building on that. And during our learning days, we have uh, different speakers. We had 
different uh, speak notes and reading materials, which all the time resonated with, it's a, it was like a cobweb. It resonated all the time, they connected. And whenever we had different perspective and we reached an agreement on uh, where it could be our next step, they were like, yes, we nailed it. Um, my other step is when we did the uh, benchmark study and we found the findings that correlated with our focus group uh, responses, even though we had low tunnel, it was a positive moment to go with drawing the recommendations on how our uh, score can be sustainable and as leaders of some extent as academics that adds in value. My aha uh, moment, uh, just like this was whole thing was a learning curve for me, like learning, like I'm new to the nonprofit and everything, and walking us through everything. Thankfully, they were part of this group. Um, just um, it was a continuous learning curve for me, and I just uh, it was a great learning curve, and I uh, learned a lot from this, and uh, that was pretty much. It. Is there any other questions? One more? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, if you go back through your journey of the past couple months, is there any learning tools or anything that you feel would be important for the earlier coalition that they uh, to implement as they go forward? Yeah, well, one of the things that we intentionally wove into the new purpose um, was a specific call out to inclusivity. And the reason we noted that is like, like Kara mentioned, the last two years, they've been really hard. And, and with like the loss of funding and the way that like, daycare changed, the costing associated with it, it really became focused on like those daycare providers and how like, do you best support that. Um, but as we talked to various members of the coalition, quietly some people would put their hand up and kind of say like, oh, we talk about his daycare. And we, we've got these wonderful resources we want to share, like we want to tell people about it, but the agendas were just dominated largely with like child care conversation. Um, so, so that's something we, we've certainly been brought up and it's something that we intentionally wove into the new purpose. So as they reflect on that, uh, it, it'll always be pulling them forward to, together and intentionally sitting down and listening to one another. I think the other thing to note is through a new redevelopment, we can't have 80 action items. We really have to ask. There's 13 people that consistently came to this group. So part of our recommendation is we vote down five priority areas, really for them to focus on so that they could be sustainable and feel successful throughout the next year of their development. My point on adding on that, uh, through what I observed from this whole process and this study, and from my experience within my uh, profession, I would uh, appreciate like, all the time going back into our actions. Uh, are we really achieving what we are set to do? Making them smart and reflecting to what resources we have and taking it back to areas coalition and in our recommendations. I'm hopeful and I'm certain that they will uh, achieve the sustainable model as we drew down a couple of activities and actions based on the uh, resources and the capacity. I did have a comment for both great work, and uh, I have a vested interest in the earlier coalition. I, I shared it for six years before going over to see social. And it, the earlier coalition aside, and Pastu plays aside, and all the projects aside, the themes that we see here sustainability um, and community contribution, or since the hardship, COVID, workload, and, and, and all of those things. And I really love how you highlighted throughout um, your presentation in the last group how. You, you have to be willing to accept and overcome some of those things. And um, in particular, the comments for this group about, you know, well, I'm in mean, the industry, you're in social profit, and we need to merge and understand one another work in this world. I think that's a huge lesson for all of us, is that we do need to set back sometimes and understand other people's worlds, because you can't have social sustainability or economic development, anything without the other. So uh, I think that's a huge lesson that came from, from, from all of these projects so far. So, so. <coughs>
Hey everybody, good morning. Uh, thanks for being here. We're really excited to uh, tell you about our project that we've been working on over the uh, course of the LWB program here. Um, we do have a, a few uh, kind of uh, notes up front and then we'll get into the actual slides. So, Nistawayu Association Friendship Center. Step one for me was figuring out what that word meant. Um, so, it, well, besides uh, my two friends here, uh, Stacy and, and Rhonda, uh, does anybody else want to take a guess at what that word actually represents? I'm describing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, it, it means the coming together of three rivers in Crete. And if you look at their logo, um, you'll see that it actually signifies three rivers come together. So there's a piece of trivia for you. Um, uh, we wanted to talk about some of the themes and similarities because um, as we've gone through the program, through our learning days, and then as we've actually watched the, the last two groups here, we've realized that a lot of the things that we've experienced and had to go through have been extremely similar. So for me, um, my kind of reflection is that regardless if, if you're running a complicated outfit like the base plant or the mine or, or extraction or whatever, or if you're leading a community group, or if you're going through a community action project with, with uh, your cohort here, you're definitely going to encounter curveballs. There are going to be things that you wanted to achieve that you don't achieve, and, and probably one of the biggest skills that you need to have throughout uh, whatever you're going through in life is adaptability because I can pretty much guarantee you that whatever you envision for eight or nine months from now, um, it's probably not going to turn out to be exactly what you had in mind. And, uh, and the other groups also certainly lose to that. Um, the other thing I want to, to mention here before we actually get into the slides is uh, first of all from the Friendship Center we have Stacy and Rhonda here with us, so we're happy that they were able to join us. Um, and we also wanted to acknowledge our two friends here uh, that, that led the whole program. Uh, Sherry, she kept us on the rails, kept everything organized, um, lots of challenges. We had to have a couple of virtual sessions. We had um, hybrid sessions where some people were, were present and, and some were on Zoom. And you know, she just did a wonderful job of, again, being adaptable and, and getting us through all of our, our learning days, keeping us organized. And also uh, Colin. So Colin was, was the other facilitator, and uh, I would say that he, had, he struck a perfect balance between uh, fun and learning. So we, we did a lot of activities that were truly enjoyable, like uh, we, we spent some time outside doing geeky uh, <laughs> type activities, I would say, and they were a lot of fun, especially for some of the engineers here, I think they, they, they took it to a whole other level, but at the same time, it just kind of helped reinforce some of the things that um, he, was, he was trying to teach us about leadership ability. And okay, so that's a few upfront notes. Next slide. There we go. So we're going to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, Heidi will do that. We're going to do a little bit of introductions about ourselves. We're going to talk about the project evolution. And like I already mentioned, some curveballs along the way. But uh, we will explain how what happened and how we got through it. Heidi is going to talk about the Friendship Center, just a, a brief overview for folks that are, are not familiar with the center and what it does and, and some details. I will go through um, basically the, the actually what we did, I'll say, in, in our project and show you the, uh, the final deliverables. Kathleen is going to talk about sustainment because one of the things that Colin and Sherry cautioned us about right from the beginning is that it's great to have lofty goals, but if you get partway through something and nobody's able to pick it up when you're finished, it's, uh, it, it may be a waste of effort, so, so you're better off having either a, a smaller project that you're able to see through to completion, or you need to have a really, a really good plan for how it's going to be continued after you've moved on and, and the next person. 
And then uh, we'll go through the challenges and successes as well. So for our land acknowledgement, we would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 8 territory. The ancestral and traditional land of the Cree, Dene, and unceded territory of the Métis people. And we wish to work together in the spirit of kindness and kinship to honor these beautiful lands together. So we'll do some personal introductions here. I'm up first. My name is Kathleen McKenzie. Um, I've been in the area for around 10 years now. I'm originally from Nanaimo, BC, so I didn't actually know what winter was at all until I moved here. This is, I learned to drive in the snow up here. <laughs> um, I work as a process engineering lead in primary extraction. So for those in the room that don't work for Suncor, that's the safe, reliable operation of mixing dirt and hot water together. And that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of my favorite things to do, or sorry, my favorite things in Wood Buffalo, having been here for 10 years. So I actually moved up here by myself graduated university and came here. I have no family in Alberta at the time, and it's really it's the people. Um, I've made a lot of really good friendships here. Everyone comes together as a community, like it's so inspiring, and I would say this, this is my hometown now, and this is where my family is too. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Dan Hatcher. Um, my hometown is a place called Paradise, also from Newfoundland like a few other people here. So Paradise, Paradise is kind of similar to Fort McMurray in a way because there's very few people that are actually from there. Um, it's a place that, that a lot of people move to because it's a suburb of, of St. John. So back back there, if somebody say, where are you from? I'd say Paradise, it's, it's like, where, where are you really from? <laughs> I actually am from there. So there um, I've been in Wood Buffalo almost exactly three years. So I, I moved here pretty much three years to the day uh, ago, uh, transferred up here with Suncor. I immediately prior to that, I was doing the, the fly in, fly out thing um, from back east, and that was a, a very difficult lifestyle and not for me. Um, previous to that, I was uh, working offshore on a couple of projects uh, that we, we have uh, out in life. So, I've been with Suncor almost uh, almost 11 years. It's been uh, a lot of very different jobs, but uh, a lot of uh, very enjoyable roles and uh, common themes as well. Um, currently, I'm a project lead in the upgrader, so we do sustaining projects, to things to, to keep the place running, basically, and, and incremental improvements and things like that. And so, my favorite thing about living in Wood Buffalo, I've known for a week that I needed to tell you what my favorite thing is, and I still don't exactly know what I should say. <laughs> uh, I would say what I'm enjoying most right now is watching my kids uh, grow up. They, they're 13 and 11, so they were, uh, I don't know, 8 and 10 when, when we moved here, and I've really enjoyed seeing them um, make new friends and adapt to living here, especially in the summer months. I mean, you, you, you live in Parsons Creek, you spend a lot of time outside on the trails, and the kids enjoy the amenities and stuff so that's that's one of my favorite things about being here and <coughs> the other I, I would say is the diversity um, where I came from it, it wasn't the most diverse place so it's, it's really interesting and it's really good learning also from my kids I think to, to see different lifestyles and, and, and different norms and things like that. My name is Heidi Major and my hometown is Edmonton so originally an Alberta girl unlike many of you Newfoundlanders um, I got a call while working at the city, a gentleman had the wrong department, but we got to chatting and he asked me, where are you from back home? And I said, well, sir, I'm not from back home, I'm from Alberta. <laughs> and he said I was nice enough and so I was allowed to stay. So um, I've made Fort home since 2006, been with the municipality since 2008 where I started off as a program um, assistant then became the landlord tenant advisor for the region and currently work on the community plan to end homelessness. Um, one of my favorite things about living in Wood Buffalo is the trails, exploring um, boreal forests with my dog, and like everybody else says, um, the people. I don't have family up here, but I believe our community is family and it's what makes us home. 
Okay, um, so project evolution. So like many of the other projects already described earlier, uh, we went through our own kind of uh, process of figuring out what we need to do and how best to support. So initially when we came through Leadership with Buffalo, we had a project submission through the United Way and we were kind of looking at that. There wasn't really any um, specific organization that was mentioned to work with at that time. Uh, they also wanted us to do a SWOT analysis, um, which for a lot of engineers in the room, like that piqued my interest. It's like, oh yes, data. We're gonna look at data, <laughs> gather data, and use that for <laughs> implementation to help the organization out. But um, after we had a couple conversations with Stacy as well through um, the Nisawaii Friendship Center, and it was determined that they already have a SWOT analysis done. So we had to do a pivot there. Um, we actually um, decided to work with the Friendship Center directly, and this is due to a little bit of um, different messaging, messaging within the project itself, um, some of the disconnects there. So we just went directly with the Friendship Center, and we've been working with them ever since. So the Nisawaya Friendship Center has been in our community since 1964 and became a not-for-profit registered um, society in 1974. They are dedicated to the social and recreational activities for our community, open to everyone with a mission to bring together and promote and encourage relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in the community. They offer services and programs for people of all ages with a focus on traditional values and culture. They've been significantly impacted by the flood of 2020, still dealing with the consequences of that. And um, it's just so important that this community, or this facility get back up and running because they are a place for community gatherings, memorials, and a chance for people to connect with resources within our community. And they serve not only the over 700 registered members, but the community as a whole. Okay, so as, as uh, already mentioned, there's, there's been a bit of an evolution in the project. So basically, after discussing with Stacy, what we determined was the most valuable thing and what was needed was to help the Friendship Center in identifying uh, new sources of grants and basically revenue. It's, um, it's an expensive place to live and, and uh, be, and uh, as we already mentioned, they've gone through quite a few hardships in the last couple of years, and on top of COVID that we've all experienced, um, obviously with the flood downtown, and I'm sure it's affected other groups as well, but it's certainly affected the Friendship Center in particular. Um, so basically the, the challenge that the, the uh, Friendship Center and then many small nonprofit agencies have is they just don't have resources. A lot of the folks that are, are on the board and the executive and, and around these places, they, they probably have day jobs and they also have families and kids and sickness and everything else. And when you pile on other challenges like floods, uh, there's, there's just not enough time in the day to, to uh, everything that needed to be done. So Stacy said to us our, her biggest challenge was, was finding uh, revenue and, and grants and that's where we thought we could we could help out. So we were kind of fortunate in that um, the area MP's office has compiled a pretty comprehensive list of available grant funding um, for well, Canada-wide really but focused on Alberta. Um, but it was a significant amount of work to go through it. Um, there was about 175 or so identified grants and well, we, we started trying to, to actually print off a hard copy of the binder and we eventually gave up on printing because it, it was, it was uh, so lengthy. So it was a lot of uh, time to just sit together and review these things and, and basically grind through it. So yeah, we, we went through approximately 175 existing grants, um, both both from the public and private sector that potentially would be available to, to any nonprofit. Um, but what we needed to do was filter through them and figure out where with a limited amount of time and resources, it was 
the best place for the Friendship Center to devote their grant writing time. So we arrive at a list of 19 of 175 that we felt were most fitting and most aligned with the Friendship Center's uh, mission and vision and their activities and what they offer where we thought they would be best uh, what's the word, best advised to, to uh, devote their, their grant writing resources. Most attainable word we use. So it was interesting to actually see what some of these grants were. There's obviously everybody knows there's, there's uh, all kinds of uh, federal and provincial programs, but it was pretty enlightening also to see the number of corporate programs that are out there that are not well advertised. Um, and some of them are, are very specific to, uh, for companies for where they operate. So there, there's companies out there that um, they would like to actually you know, contribute to specifically to a place like Wood Buffalo because it's the center of where they operate. That was an enlightening piece for us. Okay, so in terms of the deliverables, um, we came up with a master spreadsheet and sat down as a group and we had the different criteria listed so it was easy to search and for the Friendship Center to also refer back to as often as necessary including direct links to more information on the grant so of course pretty easy so grant title if there was an available amount uh, we researched it put it in there to see how much they could qualify for um, what the purpose of the grant was and then the alignment with the strategic plan so make sure that it aligns with all like the values of the programming and what the grant was supposed to do um, we also did the specific eligibility criteria and then any sort of dates or deadlines to be aware of some of them are renewed annually some of them were if you got the grant once then you could only apply every five years and some it really just varied especially um, for certain things like recovering from the flood, like you could apply for certain grants with that, but then that would um, become obsolete for a different year based on what's going on in town. So we came up with this, and then in terms of the sustainment, so we, very key, very important, after all this work going through hundreds of grants, we wanna make sure that um, it actually does go forward, and hopefully the Nisawaii Friendship Center is able to get some grant money. So we handed it over um, to Stacy uh, about a month ago. Um, should require minimal sustainment activities. So unless there's there's a pretty comprehensive list of grants, but they shouldn't be changing too much over the years or as new ones become available, we can easily add that to the master list. Um, so they're gonna use that as a starting point. Um, and the Friendship Center has hired a part-time uh, employee to actually start going through the grants and applying themselves. So like with every project, there are challenges and successes. Um, one of the uncomfortable challenges we had was the realization that there is an unconscious stereotype still within our community and um, a part of that ended up resulting in a um, few social bringing forward some training for our entire cohort on truth and reconciliation. So um, there was great learning in that challenge as uncomfortable as it was. Um, like everybody in this region, we are busy. And so the alignment of people's schedules was also a challenge. And um, there, we lost a lot of time in the beginning of this project because we didn't really have clear direction on where we were going. And um, the original project was written in quite a vague way, but the opportunity in that was we were able to forge for a path that allowed us to work directly with Stacy and the Hawaii Friendship Center and um, really focus on what worked for us. Um, but we really needed to be aware of our limited time because of that challenge now, right? So um, we did adapt as a team to the changing circumstances um, and we got feedback directly from the Nisdawayu Friendship Center, which was very valuable. We were able to deliver a product um, to them 
that we believe is going to bring value to their organization. And again, the, the feedback we received from State Gate, the Executive Director at the Nipsey Friendship Center was very pivotal, pivotal on our direction and making sure that we were on track because we did have such a slow start. Um, as a team and as individuals, we, we gained realization and became familiar with the goals of the Nistawayu Friendship Center and their program and their importance in the community. And we also came to the realization, I work for the municipality, my two colleagues here work for Suncor, and we work for big organizations. We've got a lot of resources, we've got a lot of people, and um, the funds tend to be much more attainable. And coming to the realization that smaller, not-for-profit Indigenous groups um, have struggles compared to the organizations we are working with, and that was both a success and a challenge. I 
say, for me, actually, I found it so refreshing, too, just learning everything. Um, just kind of put me out into, like, a different circle of learning. And one of the key things for me is just how much, uh, how many challenges there are in the community, and especially with getting funding and things like that. Uh, was quite eye-opening, and even just the different, all the different organizations um, that exist, like I didn't even know about the Hawaii Youth Friendship Center initially, so finding out that there's over 700 registered members is pretty huge, so that's great learning. Um, I was pretty, I guess, naive to what really goes on in the community. I think maybe it was Josh who said something very similar in, in the last presentation worked for Suncor all my life, very much a corporate type person. Um, for me, far and away, the biggest learning was about how things operate in the, in the nonprofit space. I, I didn't know anything about it. I mentioned Sherry was such a great uh, organizer, and one of the things that she did for pretty much every one of our learning days was brought in somebody from the community to speak to us. So I, I'm, I'll probably miss some, but we had a, a lady from the Salvation Army that came in, uh, the SPCA, uh, St. Aidan's, and, and there was a couple others, sorry, I, I don't have one here. And I've, I found almost pretty much every one of those was probably my most enjoyable. Chantal actually came in one time. <laughs> 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 And as mentioned, I, I do work with social profits and I have the privilege of supporting the agencies that support our most vulnerable, and that's the homeless in our community. Um, but you know, even listening to the speakers who I have known and have connected with many times, I'm always surprised at the amount of work they do and the various projects they are working on. And um, again, working with two people from Suncorp, the support that industry um, is putting into our community, I think is so valuable. Now in this group we have um, Darshana Dab, Amanda DeCoste, Brittany Ganez, Akshaya Lakshmi, Musava Malik, also known as Muzz, we all know him as Muzz, and Andrew Wilcox. Take it away. Well, I'll put the mic back. You be the only one that needs it. I, I can do well. We have prepared a video for you to introduce our project, so we'll start over here shortly. So throughout the program, we have used a creative way to present our project updates, which we will also be doing today. So those of you that were in the cohort with us, you know what we're talking about. Um, so as you'll see soon, it's in the format of our own TV show, so we hope you enjoy. Um, and you might see some faces of people on our team that weren't able to be here today.
Oh, hello. Thanks for stopping by. Welcome to another edition of Wood Buffalo Bison Den. This is the show where local entrepreneurs and local leaders try to pitch their idea to our Wood Buffalo Business Bison. They want to get some funding for their cool idea to help nonprofits in the Wood Buffalo region. But our bison, they're tough. They're looking for ideas that are gonna work and are gonna help the most people possible in Wood Buffalo. So, the Giver team has come back once again. This is our final episode. We've got tons of cool content coming and more. The Giver team want to pitch their app, the Giver app, which lets people donate easily through an app to all their favorite nonprofits in a fun, interesting, and safe way. So let's get caught up with our bison right now and see what they're thinking about this final episode and our last chance for the Giver team to pitch their app. First off, let's introduce our bison. Hi, my name is Brittany Ganese. I'm a business development manager for Bumper to Bumper here in Fort McMurray. I've spent the last almost 10 years volunteering as well as serving boards within our community. I've enjoyed every moment of Leadership Wood Buffalo. Between the people I've met and learning the intricacies of leadership that I will use in my career as well as my personal life. Hi, I'm Muzaffar Malik, working at Suncor Energy as Operations Team Lead. For past many years, I have been involved in the community through various volunteering opportunities, such as for our Wood Buffalo Food Bank, Salvation Army, uh, Autism Awareness Society, uh, and Youth Hockey. Most memorable moment for me would be this idea of having such app uh, giver uh, came to our minds. It clicked right away to all of us and we thought uh, this is something we want to be associated with. Muzz, you've talked to the Giver team before but have decided not yet to give them your money. What's holding you back at this time? Yeah, I guess these guys have come a long way and I'm excited for their app uh, but first come first I want to see that is this app is ready to go and also how's the sustainability of this app is looking that's my concern I hope they got answers for me today I think those are super valid reasons I'm interested to see the answers that the Giver app team can give you and my question is what have you thought about how the Giver app has grown over this time and the team so they shared a bunch of features with us and uh, they are looking quite promising uh, and then I'm excited. I'm, I'm almost 99.99% that I'm up for this app. So let's see. Oh, you're being a little nice. I don't know, man. Maybe you want to hold back a little bit before you let them know 99% in. Brittany, I don't know. You've been kind of tougher on this team over the last little while, but understandably so. They've had a few road bumps. They've seen a few issues, but they seem really passionate about what they're creating. What do you need to see before you're willing to fund this app? Well, when we first seen this, so it was in the infancy stages of the app development and the idea. Um, I guess I'm not as tech savvy as Muzz here, and I really want to see who the people are developing this, and who's behind the idea itself, and what is it going to do for our community? Hi, I'm Andrew Wilcox. Um, I used to be the program director of Mix 103.7 and 100.5 Cruise FM in Fort McMurray. I'm now working for the same company for a couple of stations in Regina. Over the last eight and a half years in Fort McMurray, I worked with several uh, nonprofit boards and organizations. I volunteered for several events and uh, challenges and, and things like that. I had a lot of fun getting out in the community and having a good time and helping as, as much as we could. So I'm also really proud to be a part of the Leadership Wood Buffalo program. I think it is a, a great program that helped me in many ways. Uh, it wasn't exactly what I expected, but it actually turned out to be better. 
uh, just the morning conversations were probably one of my favorite parts and realizing that during the pandemic and during everything that we were going through and during our crazy times, that a lot of us that are leaders, no matter what field we're in, are going through a lot of the same things. It was nice to know uh, that we weren't alone in what we were doing, um, that we weren't alone in a little bit of our uh, insecurities and stuff like that. Uh, it was a great program. And next up, let's welcome to the stage. I know they're a little bit nervous, but I think they're ready. The Giver Team. I'm Amanda DeCoste. I am the Fund Development and Community Engagement Director at BGC Fort McMurray, formerly known as the Boys and Girls Club. Fun fa little fact about me is that I once accidentally donated every single piece of clothing that I had when I went on a long-term trip to Indonesia. Oops. I'm on the local board of directors for our paddling club here in Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo. Each summer I love to get out on the lakes and rivers surrounding our area. Giver holds a place dear to my heart as I see firsthand the struggles with the social profit sector. Giver will be able to close the gap between the community members and the social profit sector, bringing awareness and resources right to your fingertips. Hello, my name is Akshaya Lakshmi and I am currently the Communication Supervisor at Arts Council Wood Buffalo. Growing up in Fort McMurray, I have volunteered at various organizations since a young age, including the Multicultural Association of Wood Buffalo, various theater companies, the Northern Lights Regional Health Center, and many more. I currently sit on the boards of the Wood Buffalo Regional Science Fair and Brainstem Alliance, as well as regularly volunteer at the Oil Sands Rotary Music Festival. My favorite part about the Leadership Wood Buffalo program has been creating connections with everyone. I learned something from every single person in the program and can't wait to use all of those skills both in my personal and professional life. Hello, my name is Darshana Dave. I'm the Economic Development Officer at Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo Economic Development and Tourism. And I'm involved in the community as a program manager for Fort Buffalo Regional Innovation Network, where I support innovation in the community uh, by, by supporting and managing the committees uh, who are working towards entrepreneurship and innovation development. Uh, my best moment from uh, the Leadership Wood Buffalo is working with my team. Uh, it has been a fun ride. Uh, we always have a round table at the end with fun uh, moments and uh, love working with my team. So that's, that's the best moment I have. Well, it's been another intense experience with our bison and our giver team. And I don't know where exactly this is gonna go, but I'm excited to see the outcome. We're gonna go sit with the giver team and do a little behind the scenes, see how it went, see if there was any inner turmoil, see if they got any stories. Let's talk to them. Um, our, journey with, uh, our journey with Leadership Wood Buffalo began in September when we met as a large cohort and chose projects, which formed a community action project once our group was established, we were very excited and energetic to begin and move forward with our ideas. Having a knowledge base of active community members, as you've seen, in our group allowed our team to have meaningful dialogue about the current struggles and the needs in the sector that we were being exposed to. The most common theme uncovered was funding ranking the highest to awareness and for staffing. Um, to be able to fill current grant requirements and facilitate programming. Further to our findings, we investigated similar cities' social, social sectors like Red Deer. We discovered similar exposure within comparable sectors. This created the question, how does our community create awareness and donation and funding opportunities for, lo for local social profits without creating additional human resource requirements? And the conclusion we reached that was, uh, although there is a lot of focus on the volunteerism, but it's still clearly we are missing out on the awareness part of it, and as well as their immediate needs, how they can be met. So the big questions were, how do we create a fun, easy, and attractive way to positively impact our community's social profit needs without creating more work for them? How do you engage the community to get involved? And who doesn't love instant gratification? The answer to these questions is simple. It's Giver. Giver is an app that will connect the community members who would like to donate money, resources, time to the social profit. 
while bringing awareness to the social profits brand and their banks. We have created a, mission, a vision and mission. Our vision states reducing barriers to assessing community resources to create a fully engaged and connected community, followed up by our mission, which is connecting social profits in need with those who want to give. These are our values here. So we valued awareness, collaboration, inclusive uh, connection, innovation, and transparency. We are here to learn how we can impact our community as a group. We began realizing through our learning days and CAP group activities and interactions that the program initiates the tools for self-realization, actualization, and overall growth of individuals and as a group. Throughout the program, we each experienced minor to major personal or professional life changes, which were difficult and disruptive at times, yet we continued to adapt and push forward. Learning to adapt as individuals, as well as a group involved in a lot of multi-level check-ins, learning reliability and accountability, and awareness of others all while remaining equals. We learned that seven months is not a long time to do a project of this scale. Um, if we had more time, or zero interruptions, and not almost everybody getting COVID, <laughs> um, which we just know isn't real life, we may have a different project to present today. So before we share a demo of Giver, we would like to welcome our volunteer high school app developers, Nirmit Parikh and Sean Leon, for helping bring <laughs> Did you know our community has over 300 social profits? Most of us walk every day not knowing how to get involved. And who doesn't love instant gratification? Introducing Giver, a free to download app that connects social profits and needs with those who want to give. Giver, coming soon. Uh, before we open floor for questions, I uh, would really like to thank from our team to Sherry and Colin for facilitating this great, great program. Thank you so much. Um, as well, uh, to our wonderful cohorts, uh, what a learning experience uh, it has been with them and also to you all for being part of this whole uh, uh, presentation and coming for supporting us. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Questions? Go ahead, please. <laughs> with a catalog of different opportunities, different projects. When we went through them, it's not that they didn't speak to us, there was something missing. That was the innovation piece that was missing. So we decided to create our own. Sustainability definitely is something that was a part of the project from the beginning. This is something that you need to hit. We did meet with the Wood Buffalo Community Foundation and the struggle with it is resources. So how do you create something? And we've, we've chatted with Kayleen, and timeline-wise, for us to, <coughs> we went back and forth like everybody else with 
okay, do we just scrap this, start something fresh, go back to the drawing board, go back to that catalog, and you're a couple months in, or do you reconfigure and stretch your timeline out past that seven months to create sustainability further on? Something that it, it, it's not, nothing's ever done. Like, you're, we're constantly evolving. And this project has evolved, and speaking with the Community Foundation about it, they had their, they had their quarterly meeting yeah. uh, just a couple months ago, and she said, I would like to bring it forward, but I need more. And with us having this working across our desks, it, like, we all are, in, as you can see, involved in a lot of different things. That seven month timeline is not sustainable for us to meet. So extending that and having something, which we literally just got that video of the actual app, like this morning, <laughs> um, of what that looks like, to create it into that. So going live with it is gonna take some time and presenting something that is refined for, say, few Social, would, or for Community Foundation, or anybody to take on. We want it to be simple so it's not additional resources to take up. Um, and that was, like I said, with Community Foundation, she's like, it's a great idea, it's a great concept. Creating that awareness is what we really want to pick at and that easy to donate, but we have to think of the resource side of things because no matter what industry you're in, what sector you're in, people are the hardest things to find and keep and retain and the whole nine yards of it. How do we make that easy? And I'd like that answer it. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike the other groups, we flipped on our heads in February, so we were already way in. So way too far. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't give up. Um, and you know, issues come up with technology and illnesses and busy schedules and whatnot. So um, resource is the key. But we're, I think, once we get past this a bit of a technology hurdle, um, the resources are going to be low. So we firmly believe that someone will be like, oh, it's a, a bit more ready now. Okay, now I have the resources to take up. On the bright side, the infrastructure of this app is ready to go. And uh, it's just a matter of taking it from here and then uh, maybe give it to the professionals and they can polish it and launch it. So good to go. We've done all of the hard work <laughs> behind it, so now it's just refining. Yeah. Oh, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm the first one. Yeah. Um, so storytelling is probably the biggest part of design development for accessing funds for a social profit. So how do you expect that, like how do you plan, sorry, <laughs> that Giver will allow this opportunity for storytelling and to share impact and not just um, like become a spectator and catfish people. Like, you know, it's, it's really easy. <laughs> It does look like Tinder, not gonna lie. You did steal I know, kind of that idea. <laughs> that was we idea. started from there. <laughs> we did. We, did. <laughs> we wanted to have fun out of whatever we are doing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But I definitely thought is it's very easy. Um, you know, we joke in the social profit sector like puppies and kittens and children, and it's very easy for those organizations to keep funds. But how about the ones that? So we're not just looking at it as a donation for dollars. Um, one of the examples when we very first started this, like Andrew, he was a part of the SPCA, he said, we are in a shortage of bleach. Yes, I'm bringing it up. <laughs> a shortage <laughs> of bleach. I need so nine much. jugs of bleach. How do you put that on Facebook? How do you tell that story of I need bleach? How do we match that up with like, Andrew there with an empty bottle of bleach, standing in a picture being like, we need bleach to clean the floors. And somebody like swipe, nah, I don't have bleach, that's not my interest. How do we make it easier than telling a story? How do, we, how do we fill that instant, immediate need without getting lost in the shuffle of an algorithm? That's something we all notice a lot. We follow a lot of pages on social media and sometimes we don't see posts from that at all. And that's not our fault, it's just the way the algorithm works. So we wanted to make it a resource platform where it was just easily accessible either for donations or to volunteer so we can link to resources that already exist like WB Volunteers and et cetera. So that's kind of what we were aiming for. And, and also at tax time, if you're sitting around and you're like, oh man, like I need to 
I need to donate. I need to, you know, have some money to claim. Well, don't open your ass. <laughs> you know, find somebody. It's easy. It's there, and it's in front of you. And I don't think that we're. And I know we're not going for the like the Suncor three hundred thousand dollar grant funding. We're looking for the smaller stuff. The the immediate. I don't, I don't want to say $10, but I want to say like individual the donation. individual donation where you can see where it goes right away. And then talking about awareness, we reached out to several uh, social profits uh, just uh, through our service and we checked with them, would this, is this something that will help you guys to create awareness in the community? And we got positive responses from they each and single. circle the Thomas head. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah. yes, yes. We sent a needs assessment out to yeah. a lot of the, the 300 <coughs> nonprofit social profits that exist. So with that feedback, we knew that this is something that could help in the social process. And the, the grant writing and reporting, how do we, I don't want to say eliminate, because it's always going to be a thing, because whenever the company I work for donates money, they want to know where that's going, right? There's always going to be that. But like, me personally, give you money, I, I, I want to know, but I don't want you to write me an essay. I want you to be like, we bought 17 new tables for the kids. Your 250 bucks went towards that. Mm -hmm. And seeing that immediate, just a different take on, on donations. Yeah. Yeah, To a certain extent, it's a demand of times as well, right? Yeah. Uh, accessibility, and then how well, everybody is using those apps these days, different apps uh, in their cell phones, and it's accessible. Maybe it's its different way of approaching this whole world of uh, uh, social profit organizations, right? I agree. But I guess, you know, I hear every year on the project, we'll be like, well, we continue. <laughs> and a lot of times, the groups do continue, but why that? again once uh, anybody if no one has any questions thank you so much over to you today. Buffalo program will be opening soon on May the 4th. 
So if anybody has uh, sparked an interest or wants more information about the program, uh, please feel free to visit our website at www.viewsocial.ca. Or if you're able to stick around after, you can chat with me or some members of our team. Um, I'd now like to invite Colin Funk, who has been the lead facilitator of Leadership of Buffalo for the past 13 years, to just say a few final words. Colin? Yeah. Uh, I'm just in awe, of course, each year when I get to see the end result of what starts out as a really chaotic process. I don't know if you all remember. Um, one of your challenges was, here's some ideas, and go away and figure out what's the best project for the best configuration. And it's chaos, right? And it works its way into all these different uh, beautiful kind of processes, and here we are today. And I was just sitting here, and I was thinking, 13 years, I've actually witnessed around 50 to 60 of these projects. And it's fascinating, like it actually is the secret sauce of this program, right? Because really what it is, is that these learning days combined with this really tangible kind of real world outcome, right? So theory to practice, theory to practice, and you, you get stuck here, and then you take this detour, and you kind of get messed up, or you get a different idea, and then you, co you go back to so this beautiful, fluid motion and always incredibly diverse. Um, but also think about it. Uh, what if the rest of the countries in Canada, or Canada, the cities in Canada actually had a program uh, like this? We would be in a very different state. Uh, as far as I know, this program with this process is the longest running kind of situation of a, of a community in, in the country. There's been many, many leadership, you know, leadership, Vancouver, Victoria, Calgary, a lot of those don't exist anymore. But there's something about the sustainability and the innovation that shows up in this community that allows a program like this to exist and thrive. But just imagine if every little small town, every little region had a structure like this where you invite people to show up and think about it and allow their personal leadership to come forward, and then they connect it to all the other parts. To me, it's just like such a beautiful thing. And thank, thank you to all of you that took that call, uh, not knowing necessarily what you're, you're getting yourself into. And I also want to just acknowledge, like when there's three, four, or five people up here, there's actually a much bigger circle, right? Each one of those community action groups, that's a group of about six to 20 to 30 people, and that's husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, kids, that allow the space for those folks to get into, I mean, just think of the detail. You know, just, how many emails did you send? How many sentences did you rewrite? How many calls did you make? You know, here we are, beautiful presentations, but that deep, deep amount of time and effort and commitment and fortitude is just so inspiring. So thank you for keeping this legacy moving forward of this incredibly unique community development process and all of you uh, supporters today on many different levels, partners, sponsors, friends and family. It has been uh, such a treat to witness and excited to know that uh, you know we'll be moving into another year and, and watching all of this uh, move forward. So thank you very much. Um, what a, uh, always in awe uh, of what uh, this community and this leadership Please mingle. Enjoy. Look forward to seeing the rest of you uh, in the cohort tomorrow. And I stand with that. I, I've got two really good easy things that uh, I'm not leaving without facilitating tomorrow. So not to be. Uh, Thank you very much. Colin, I'd like to give you a great big thank you for all of the wisdom and all of the knowledge and all of the history and all of your creativity that you always bring. Um, also, joy, pleasure, honor to get to work with you, get to know you, get to see you know, your legacy throughout our community. It's been really wonderful, so thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to be here today to come out and support your colleagues, your friends, your family members, each other. Um, it's really wonderful. Once more, I would like to thank our program sponsors, Suncor Energy and the Regional Municipality of Buffalo. 
Our first three sponsors, Suncor Energy, Syncrude, and the Headco Group. Um, thank you to Deputy Mayor Granison and for all of you who showed up today. Uh, big thank you to my team at Peace Social who came and helped, um, came early and helped set up and with all of the coffee and everything, especially Shannon and Kayla, thank you so much. Um, and everybody else who helped if I was back in the kitchen <laughs> frantic about coffee. Um, yeah, so that wraps up today. Once again, um, please, if you have time, we'd love it if you could stay and mingle. If you have questions that you didn't get a chance to, to get answered during the presentations, you can mingle amongst the cohort, uh, anyone here at Fuse Social, and just, just have some time together. So enjoy your day, and thanks again for